Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 31. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms round him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Well, two years ago now, a group of 12 teenage boys and their football coach um, became lost in a cave in Thailand. Divers risked their lives as they went into the submerged cave to to try and find them. Several days, their their families camped outside the cave, desperate for for news of their children. People around the world uh, watched the unfolding events on TV and prayed for their rescue. Eventually, after 10 days, word came through that they'd been found four kilometres into the cave on a ledge. 
and the mood outside the cave turned from worry and anxiety to jubilation, which was even greater when they were finally rescued and brought home. This morning we're looking at three parables uh, that Jesus tells about things or people who are lost and found. And in each case, the stories end in celebration and rejoicing. First of all, there's the parable of the lost sheep, in which a farmer who has a hundred sheep loses one of them, but goes off to find it, such is the importance of that sheep to him. When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home and calls his friends and neighbours together, saying, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. Jesus compares that with the rejoicing that there is in heaven when one sinner repents. In the second parable, Jesus describes a woman who has ten silver coins and loses one. Again, she goes to great lengths to to find it. And and likewise, when she finds it, she has a big party with her friends and neighbours. And once again, Jesus makes the comparison with the rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. It's easy to think, well, that's a pretty simple message. I don't really need a whole sermon on it. But what I think needs a bit more explanation is what exactly does it mean to be lost? What does it mean to be a sinner? What does true repentance look like? And how does this link to the passage we looked at last week? In chapter 14 last week, we studied a challenging passage in which Jesus explained the cost of discipleship, which meant giving up everything for Jesus and carrying our cross. Well, in the chapter this morning, Jesus describes those who fail to do that as being lost. And as they realize their mistake, their need for Jesus, and turn to him, they become found. However, in order to be found, they need somebody to find them. And that person is Jesus, whose mission, as we heard from Nathan earlier, is described in chapter 19 of Luke as coming to seek and to save the lost. The challenge is that there are all different types of being lost. And people who are lost do not always realize it. Or if they do, they're not always willing to admit it. This was the, the, the birthday card that you can see the picture here I received from my boys uh, this year. I'm not sure exactly what they're, they're getting at. I don't think we were really lost. It's just the map that was wrong. We're going to be focusing this morning on the third and longest parable of the three, which is commonly known as the parable of the prodigal son. It's a bit of a, of a misleading heading because uh, it's not just the story of one lost son, it's the story of two lost sons. One who knows they're lost, and the other who doesn't. If we are Christians, we we were once lost and have been found. But that doesn't mean that there there aren't still sinful attitudes that uh, we need to repent of and ask Jesus to help us with. Well, before we get into the parable, it's important to see who is Jesus talking to. Look back at the beginning of of chapter 15 and verse 1, and there it says, Now... The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. These are those people who, because of their their immorality, have been socially excluded. And as we will see, they represent the younger brother. Then there's another group who are are critical of Jesus for for mixing with them. Verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This group represents the older brother. They are respectable members of society because outwardly they never do anything wrong. They try hard to keep to the religious commandments and traditions. What they can't understand is why would Jesus want to eat with sinners? To have a meal in that culture would mean that you accept them. And so they start muttering. And it's in response to this muttering of the Pharisees and and teachers of the law that Jesus tells these three parables. And he's got two aims as he does so. One is to reveal to to the moral outcasts that they've become lost through their selfish and rebellious behaviour. But they can still receive God's grace. They can still be found. And the other one is to reveal to the religious leaders that they too have become lost through their self-righteousness, but they too can receive God's grace. 
Let's look at their younger brother first, because the, the point is here is that Jesus seeks to save those who reject his love and go their own way. Jesus starts the, the third parable by saying in verse 11, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now that's quite an outrageous thing to ask. The estate would not normally be divided up before the death of the father. So what he's effectively saying is, I don't love you. I just want what you have. Imagine how you would feel as a parent if your child said that to you. And in that particular society, which demanded huge respect for for elders and parents, the father would be expected just to cut his son out of his inheritance there and then and send him off penniless. But incredibly, it says, so he divided his property between them. When our love or friendship is is rejected, our, our normal response is probably to get angry with that person, to stop loving them, in order to try and reduce the pain of rejection. The father in the story maintains his love for his son, even though it means enduring both the disgrace as well as the pain of rejected love. The story continues. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. It's the title, the the prodigal son, the the reckless or wildly extravagant son. And having squandered his money, he was then hit by a misfortune. Carries on, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Maybe he thought when the money ran out, he would just get himself a job or maybe sponge off others, but things went against him. There were no jobs. All he could get was a job feeding pigs. Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. He is a rock bottom. Eventually, We're told he came to his senses. He realizes that his father has lots of hired servants who are far better off than he is. He knows that he no longer has the right to be treated as his son, but maybe his father would take him on as a hired servant. So he sets off for home. And as he gets within sight of home, we're told that his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. Although the father let him go and do his own thing, he had not given up loving him. He was even looking out for him. You would expect him to uh, play it cool, to to wait for the son to get to the house, to to get down on his knees and beg for forgiveness. You would expect to question him, to make sure that his repentance was genuine. But incredibly, again, particularly for that culture of that time, he, he ran to his son, we're told. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The son starts his pre-rehearsed speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But before he even gets to the request to make me one of your hired servants, his father doesn't let him finish. Quick, he says, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The robe signifies that his standing in the family has been fully restored. He doesn't need to earn his way back. He doesn't need to to pay off his debts. The father is covering them for him. He also tells the servant to bring the fattened calf and and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Fattened calf is the the most expensive meat that could be eaten, reserved for very special occasions, when probably the whole village would have been invited to celebrate the restoration of the son. And the reason that gives is for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's a wonderful demonstration of the, the love of God. It's saying there is no sin that is beyond God's love and forgiveness. He may be 
listening to this this morning full of guilt or shame at something that you've done either recently or in the past, maybe over a whole period of time, thinking you just don't deserve to be forgiven. At one level, you're right. You don't deserve to be forgiven because none of us deserves to be forgiven. But the amazing thing is that whatever we've done, God will still forgive us if we confess our sin and ask for his forgiveness. Tim Keller has written a great little book on this uh, parable, which I'd recommend, entitled The Prodigal God. Because just as the son was reckless and extravagant in the way he, uh, he spent his money, so is God extravagant in the way he bestows his grace. As Keller points out, it's easy to see in the younger brother a depiction of sin that anybody would recognize. Living a self-indulgent life, ignoring God's rules. And many of us may remember a time when we were just like that. However, what is harder to see is the sin in the elder brother's attitude. And we'd be wrong to categorize them as good and bad because they represent different types of people who, who are both lost, both far from God. It's just that the younger brother's behavior makes um, his sin obvious, whereas the sin of the elder brother doesn't become clear until a particular situation exposes it. In the first instance, Jesus seeks to save those who reject his love and go their own way. But also, Jesus seeks to save those who trust in their own goodness. While all this excitement is going on, we're told in verse 25, meanwhile, the eldest son was in the field, no doubt working hard, as he always had done. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. But what is his reaction to this news? Is it the same as his father? Does he rush out to welcome him back with, with open arms? No, it's quite different. Verse 28, he became angry and refused to go in. He had a strop. By refusing to go in and join this big public debt celebration that his father's put on, he is now the one who's bringing disgrace on his father. And just as the father didn't have to go running to the younger son when he returned in disgrace, he didn't have to go out to the elder brother when he was being disobedient. And yet he leaves the celebration. He goes out to him and pleads with him to come and join the party. But the elder brother still refuses and explains why he's so angry. Look, he says, which in itself is a disrespectful way of addressing his father. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Do you see the, the heart attitude here? There's no joy or love in serving his father. There's just duty. And when we start to feel like that in our service, uh, the alarm bell should be ringing. Have we, have we lost our love for the Lord? Have we forgotten why? We are serving. What the elder son is saying is, I deserve some reward and appreciation for all my effort. I've done everything that has been expected of me. Yet, he says, you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. When you're trying to, to earn your reward and are not getting it, then inevitably you're going to get angry when you see someone else getting what you you think they don't deserve. As he says in verse 30, but when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. What has he done to deserve it? He actually deserves to be punished and instead you have a party for him. Where's the, the justice in that? It's just not fair. Although outwardly, the elder brother is a good, respectable man. Inwardly, he's full of pride. And he represents those such as the Pharisees who, who trust in their good behavior to make themselves right with God. But sadly, that is what separates them from God. And ironically, um, he's not actually much different from his younger brother in terms of what he wants. 
The younger brother wanted his share of the family wealth so he could just go off and do what he wanted with it. He was blatantly rebellious. The older brother is more subtle. He also wanted to be free to do what he wanted, but he chose a different route to obey his father, to work hard for him, so his father would be in debt to him. Neither of them loved their father for himself, but for what they could get out of him. Well, how does the father respond to this different type of rebellion? Again, with extravagant grace. My son, he says, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. He's saying, I love you because you are my son, not because of all you've done for me. Despite the way you've insulted me publicly, I still want you to join the celebration. I'm not going to disown your brother because he was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. But I don't want to disown you either. And so he's leaving him with a choice. Are you going to allow your pride to exclude yourself from the celebration? Or are you going to humble yourself and show that same grace that I've showed towards your younger brother? And the reason the story is deliberately left on a cliffhanger is because the message of the parable is directed at the Pharisees, the elder brothers. They were shocked by the story because uh, the younger brother who, who loves prostitutes is saved, but the elder brother who's morally upright is still at the end of the story lost. It's a reversal of all they've known. And what Jesus is saying to them is, are you going to continue to remain proud of keeping all the rules and traditions of your religion and think that through your, your self-discipline and obedience you've earned your place in heaven? Are you going to continue to think yourselves better than these sinners and prostitutes who have repented of what they've done wrong? Or are you going to receive God's grace, his undeserved loving kindness, by which we are all saved and join the celebration? I wonder when you read this story, what is your natural reaction? I think for many, it's um, a sympathy with the elder brother. Because we all still have some of his uh, sinful traits in ourselves, even though we may be unaware of them. Ask yourselves uh, these questions. <clears throat> How do you feel when your prayers aren't answered the way you want them to be answered? Or when you experience more than your fair share of suffering and injustice? <clears throat> Does it make you angry with God? And you've given up so much for him. How, how could he let this happen to you? Or do you recognize that you are fully dependent on his mercy? How do you feel when your service is not appreciated by others? How do you feel towards other Christians when they, they don't live up to your level of, of commitment or, or service? Are you resentful? Do you, do you look down on them? It's not that we should overlook sinful or immature behavior in others, but instead of being critical or resentful, we should help them, help them to, to resist sin, help them to grow in their maturity. Is our church, are our home groups places where people feel comfortable about opening up about their deeper struggles? Or are we putting on this veneer of respectability? How do you feel towards those who seem far from Jesus? Have you, have you given up on them? The, bro the younger brother was as far as you could get from, from God, and yet God brought him home. Let's never dismiss anyone as being beyond God's grace, but pray that he would bring them home. In the book of Lamentations that we looked at recently, it says, let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. But what does it mean to return to the Lord? What is true repentance? Well, thirdly and finally, true repentance that brings rejoicing in heaven means a change in heart and not just behavior. In each of these three parables, there is rejoicing in heaven over a sinner who repents. It's a change in the attitude of our hearts that says, I was lost and now Jesus has found me. 
In the case of the younger brother, it was clear from his behavior that he was lost. He was busy leave, leading a self-indulgent life. He admitted he had made a mistake to reject his father. And so he came back with no uh, explanations, no arguments to try and excuse himself. He just said, I I've messed up. Please forgive me. I cannot live without you. But true repentance is not just saying sorry for the wrong things that we've done. It is that. But it's also far more than that. At the end of the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus says there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. He's referring to those who, who don't think they need to repent because they consider themselves righteous already. They consider themselves to be right with God because of the, the righteous way in which they think they're leading their lives. In the parable of the lost sons, the elder brother is an example of just such a person. The question is, will he too repent of his pride, his self-righteousness, and come join the celebration? Or will he stay on the outside? If we are Christians already, we should be looking with the help of the Spirit to, to put to death our sinful attitudes on a sinful basis, on a daily basis. There is something of the elder brother in all of us. So let's repent of those attitudes that will cause God grief. And let's show his same grace and mercy to others. How do we do that? How do we, how do we replace that, that anger, that dryness, that, that insecurity with love and joy and peace? Or by focusing on Jesus, on what he did to bring you home when you were lost. He, he gave up his home in heaven to come and seek and save the lost so that we can be reunited with our heavenly father who wants to throw his arms around us and welcome us as his children. Let us pray that he would fill us with that same compassion that we would go out and bring home the lost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we may find ourselves in different places at the moment. Some of us might be where the younger brother is, doing things our way, recognizing that there is something missing. Help us to see that, help us to see we're lost, to confess our sins and come back to you. Others may feel that we're, we're okay, but deep down we have the same attitude of the elder brother. We are relying more on our behavior, our good deeds, than your grace. Reveal to us, we pray, those attitudes of our heart that need changing. We pray that you give us a greater compassion for the lost, that we might share the good news of Jesus with them and look forward to that day when we will join in the celebration of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing of that amazing grace as we sing our last two hymns before we close. Let's sing together at home and, or just listen in if you like.